Uh, see, while, we wait, while, while we're waiting for other people to show up, does anyone have any questions about what we talked about last time? Um, I wasn't here, so maybe just a quick recap. Maybe I had forgotten to see the recorded said, version of what we You're good. So um, what we talked about uh, last time was some electrical stuff. So we looked at um, voltage and current and resistance and some simple circuits and some simple ways to transfer data. Um, today we're going to talk about, well, we're going to have a demo from Alex. Do you know if Mr. Shankle, do you have Alex wants to do the demo at the beginning or the end? Um, let me go yell at her. Hey, Alex, are you doing this demo I now? Had, uh, yeah, I had to unstack the dishwasher. Uh, yeah, and she, mom came down and we were laughing at Barry. Yeah, so we'll, we'll do Alex's demo at the beginning. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and spend some time talking about what we want to do vision wise um, until I'll come right out of Alex's demo. And then we'll go back into looking at brushed and brushless motors. And then I think the next thing is um, uh, uh, some code libraries. Um, and if we have any time at the end, uh, we'll start talking about sensors. So. We need to know how to read a electrical diagram at all. Uh, not for what we're talking about today. But we talked mm. about how to do that a little bit in the recording from the previous lesson. And I also okay. apologize ahead of time in the diagram messages that I'm responding to. So I may be cutting out in and out a little bit to, to respond to those. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah, so, in, so in trying to map, if you were attempting to map out um, a location where you could run a wire, where, where it will be safe from the um, magnet, safe from the magnetic field generated by the motor. Um, so, would you so would you also have to take into account um, the proximity of other wires that are close that are close to your own wire to the motor as well? Get, well, given that the mo motor may also generate an electric field in those, which may also which may increase. Um, the um, the size of the electrum of the electric field is slightly more than you expected. No. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Particularly any power wires, you know, especially any of the phase wires that are going to the uh, um, like the neos and so forth are going to be particularly prone to generating that kind of noise. Um, I think. What you end up doing in the scenario is you take your sensor, you plug it in where you need to plug it in, and then you let it sit there without the value when the value shouldn't be changing, and, and actually go ahead and just measure the noise and see if it's tolerable. And if not, you try and move it to a location where it is. I don't foresee a situation where we're going to be able to calculate ahead of time, for example, where we should be placing the wire. Um, there's we have to model a lot about the robot in order to do that. It's probably easier just to actually um, uh, me measure the interference and see if it's a problem. Thank you. All right, All right. and let's see, Lindsay's got a question here. Um, right. Okay, so Lindsay is asking what session we covered timers. That would have been, see, I think session two. Yeah, time and timers. Um, okay, and uh, Alex says she's ready with the demo. So uh, why don't we go ahead and, so Alex, why don't you talk about what it is that you're going to show, um, and then and then demo it. Uh, I've got I've got it recording. Okay. So we should be able to um, have this right. So my dad um, found this Husky lens. So it's an AI camera. So on the back here, you can see there's a camera. It has all these funky little things on the back that I'm not really sure what it does. But then it and it has these different modes pre-built in. Um, and then that's some data. So we have, if I can do this two-handed, um, 
Uh, object recognition, object tracking, which is probably what we'll use for um, object recognition. And there's face, but that one's not really important unless you get bored. Um, and then there's also, God, get your, get over here. I need you to hold the camera. Sorry about that. Um, and then there's more. I can't really do this with one hand. Father! He's coming. You're holding this. So then there's also, and then there's also, um, uh, color recognition, which you can hold it on color and it'll find it around on the field, which we could also use for maybe yellow balls or something. And there's tag recognition, which is like a QR code. Um, I didn't really mess around with that because I knew we wouldn't be using tags. And then there's just settings. But there's this notch little button at the top that goes left and right. Stop moving to the center. No, I don't. Um, that goes back and forth. And you, that's how you can se select. So um, I hooked it up to an Arduino using the um, A breadboard. Yeah, well, and then the, and then I attached it, uh, the Arduino to a breadboard to simulate um, the data and what we can do with it. So it, if you can see, um, it's recognizing this uh, object and it's giving it a blue line, which means it sees it and it's learned it with an ID one. So then if it moves around, a little finicky with the lighting and stuff. Um, and then it'll move, and you can see the breadboard, the different mix you up. So there's a top, a right, a down, and a left. That was out of order. And depending on where it represents the battery, which it calls it a bottle, it'll light up the different lights. So Alex, can you talk about how you get it to recognize specific objects? Okay. So when you're learning an object, I'll just relearn this. You click this, um, there's a button at the top on the right. Yeah, so it comes with this algorithm and you just use the um, button at the top and it will capture all these pictures and it comes with it. So it's nice and easy to use. And I'll just do this one. So it's recognizing something with the white line here. And it's flashing orange or yellow, which signifies it's ready to learn something. So it'll it hold down this top, but it'll go to blue. And what happens when it goes to blue is that it's learning it and it's giving it its ID. So it recognizes it and it's also still learning because the arrow at the center of the screen is yellow. And then you can pull off and then when you move around, it will recognize it. You would have to know from like the instruction manual what method it's using for that, would you? Like the AI? Mm -hmm. um, well, I kind of focused on how to get the data from it. <laughs> That's fine. I was curious if you'd already, if you'd already seen the, I don't remember what the, the technique was. Okay, that up so that's pretty cool. Um, do you know what the resolution on the camera is? No. So that'd be the other thing to, to look for. Um, I like it. Hmm. So it seems like it seems like it's pretty easy to get. How hard does it get the data off of it, Alex? Um. Well, Would it help if we had a Raspberry Pi? Well, I was messing around with it yeah, a little bit. It was like maybe an hour to get it to work. But then again, I have never used an Arduino before. And that was the fun part. But um, the wires um, were a little finicky in the beginning. And then I got it to work. And then I had to do some finagling with the serial, like something. And mm -hmm. yeah, something like that. Um, and then I got it to work. But it wasn't too bad.
You know what baud rate you're at right now? 115200. I think you can go one, I think you can go higher. And, and, yeah. and where the teams that are using the teams that were using us on the rubbery are they just going into the UART port? There's an I2C option too. So if we don't use okay. the color sensor that we're going there, it has an I2C option. Now is that laser range finder that we got I2C? Yeah, but if we hook no. up an Arduino. Okay. There's also, I think, Alex, I think there's a second I2C port on the expansion board. Um, so I think we may actually be able to run two. Uh, I think what you can do on the expansion board is there's a number of configurable serial options where by moving jumpers around, you can dedicate some of your digital input pins, like multiples of them tied together to become different uh, uh, serial connection types. So I think I think that will support two connections. Sounds good. Does anyone, have any questions? Does anyone have any questions for Alex? Um, have you thought about the use of a Raspberry Pi instead for its use of processing power? Even though it has fewer pins and we're not as used to it, would it help with the conversion of data to try to use a Raspberry Pi? The, the line might have... Go ahead, Alex. Well, if we're going to put it on the expansion board, then I don't think we need the Raspberry Pi. Um, do you know if the Raspberry Pi is cheaper than an Arduino? Because if... Well, no, it does for the bomb. Because um, if we need to use an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, we can... $20. And $20 makes or breaks it. Um, so yeah, I mean, so the, I can the line was running with on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, and the, the line was running on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would rather, you know, I'd rather go to the cheaper option if so. The processing is all on the camera, so I don't know that we need the boost from the. Um, uh, Kendrite. One hundred mega uh, megahertz processor on it. Remember that. Um, I mean, it must be doing. It must be doing some of this on a on a chip. Yeah, I think chip, it's probably processor. processing. No, but I I think it must be doing some of these calculations not on the CPU but on an FPGA. Um, I I don't know that, but it, I I'd be surprised that a a 400 megahertz processor could do that, um, unless they're doing it on the on a on a on a FPGA. So, Alex will look that, that up yeah, for you too. Okay. Um, so one thing with this camera, right, is I think we don't get a video feed off the camera, right, or do we? Um, I'm not getting a feed. It's just it like sends back data in the form of like where the object is. So it's an X center and a Y center, and then there's a height and a width of the object. So we'd still be running probably a limelight or something in order to do, uh, or to actually drive. Mm -hmm. We could we could also look at explore options to get a USB camera and then just have a, a separate board that does the compression. Um, like put ports it over to Ethernet. Um, that way we could, or actually another, just another Ethernet camera. We could look for Ethernet webcams, and then we could bypass the limelight. Would be another option, um, just because it's cheaper, right? So if we could get an Ethernet webcam with a similar kind of wide-angle field of view that we're used to, um, that might allow us to get rid of the, the limelight in this scenario, which would help the bomb a lot. How close are we to pushing the bomb? We were, we were, yeah. Um, let's see. So I, mean, I like this. I like uh, I like how much is included in it. I think what I'd be really interested also to learn, Alex, is 
what access do we have to change the code that's running on the, the camera um, and how customizable it is um, rather than just using preloaded stuff. But what would I be interested? I think um, a good set of tasks might revolve around getting this system to the point where it at least duplicates what the limelight does. So that would be being able to track the current targets, being able to get probably a ring light um, that's bright enough, and also getting a, an Ethernet webcam or something. So having a full system code and hardware that would get us back to baseline with what we get with the limelight and the current USB camera. And then once we have that baseline, um, we can start playing around with improving upon that. So, okay. my recommendation. So maybe you guys want to think about um, over the weekend or something what breaking down those tasks would look like, and let me know what kind of hardware and stuff you need, and I'll go ahead and get it, um, and we'll get it to you, and we can we can start working on that. Um, I you know the the goal that we had planned for the summer back in last summer was to try and do a thing where we own the vision pipeline, um, just like we own the autonomous pipeline. Um, moving away from the limelight is going to be necessary for that. I don't know for sure that this is going to be the solution we end up sitting on, but it looks like a very good option. Um, so you know, we'd like to be able to do things like uh, detect the balls, for example, um, maybe more robust target detection. The one, the one thing that I sort of struggle with is identifying the places where we could improve upon the limelight. Um, so if anyone has thoughts on that, I'd be interested. Um, the, the ones that are, the one that does occur to me is um, being able, more flexibility in terms of the types of objects that we can detect. So if we want to detect things other than just the first target, for example, um, we start looking at things other than the limelight. Um, I don't know that there's any system in our budget on the market right now that would get us a better um, reading of the 3D position based off the camera target. Uh, I think, I don't know that we're going to get a system that would improve that. Um, I don't think we're going to get a system that's going to dramatically improve on the frame rate that we're getting off the limelight, either in terms of the video that's coming back to us or the, the processing speed. Um, so I think it probably comes down to our ability to do um, detecting of custom items, uh, the ability to maybe dual use the camera. So you know, if we wanted to use the camera to look at the, the spinner this year or something, instead of having a separate color sensor, the ability to sort of dual use, dual use it for other things um, would be an option there too. So those are the, the, the items that I thought about expanding. Um, does anyone else have any other thoughts about what we could be using a camera for that we can't use the limelight for? The Husky lens can do color recognition too, so if we do want to do something with that, we could have done something with that option. Can you say it again, Alex? You're breaking up a little bit. The Husky lens also has um, color recognition, so if we were needing it last year with the IGC port and stuff, we could have maybe done something. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so I think I think you know dual dual uses of these sensors is um, uh, a good reason to go to a more owning that vision pipeline a little bit. Does anyone else have any other thoughts? I see Amelie's on here. Um, I don't know. If she's been thinking at all about it different vision tasks. Amelie. Okay, well, um, <laughs> Alex, why don't you and anyone else you want to rope together, take on trying to come up with a set of tasks associated with the Husky lens and just post them in um, the, the control Slack channel and then we can work on 
looking at those tasks so we can prioritize them and, 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 and uh, um, score them and stuff and then we'll start working off because I think it is it's time that we start doing some some new items in addition to just training um, so for the husky lens is there like anything like because I'm gonna forget um, what are like the top things you want to learn by next two sessions or something so um, what I would say is first break up the tasks for getting us to the point where we duplicate the limelight capability. And then from those tasks, you'll be able to see what things you need to learn in order to answer the questions. You know, first you need to answer the question, will it be able to duplicate the limelight capability, right? So those would be the first things to answer. Does anyone else have any other questions for Alex? Um, does anyone have any questions about what we talked about last time or um, the any of the LabVIEW uh, challenges that are up on Git? Okay, so let me see if I can go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so uh, continuing on with electrical stuff from last time, I was gonna go ahead and start with um, different motor types. So does anyone wanna talk about how a, how a brushed motor works? So this would be like a Neo or a 775 motor. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Let's see, Ethan's on here. Uh, Ethan, how do you, what's your impression of how a, just a normal motor works? Okay, um, well, for a normal motor or a brush motor that, we, that um, you would use, like a 775, you put electrical current into it. And what happens is these magnets spin around and then cause the motor to spin. Yeah, so that's, that's the essence of it. So, and I didn't even, I think unfortunately I didn't grab like a nice fancy picture of a brush motor, so I'll just try and draw one here. So, um, the basic operating principle of all the motors that we're working with is that uh, we're gonna put in electric current into a set of coiled windings and they're going to generate a magnetic, magnetic field in those uh, electrical windings. And that, magnetic, that generated magnetic field is going to interact with the magnetic fields from permanent magnets. And that interaction is gonna cause the motor to spin. So in a brush motor, so I'll just have a nice cylindrical motor here. Um, the permanent magnets are actually located on the outsides of the motors. So I'm just going to stick some, some magnets here. So uh, which I think I can do. Okay, so uh, what is it? South is or north is positive and south is sorry, north is red and south is blue. I think that's sort of what people tend to use. So, in a permanent magnet, I'm sorry, in a brush motor, you've got permanent magnets on. Sorry, that was actually correct before. Uh, on the outside of the magnet. And then on the interior, you've got a electromagnet. Let me make that one dashed. 
right? So this is a coil of wire. And basically, if you loop the wire, so as you put a current into a uh, wire, if you change that current, you'll generate a magnetic field. Um, if you loop the wire around in, in a whole bunch of loops, you can generate quite a large magnetic field. So, and depending on whether the current is running in one direction versus the other direction in the circuit, you're going to get uh, either the, you know, the, the positive end on this side of the magnet or the positive end on the other side. So depending on which way the current's gone. Now, if we attach our electromagnet to um, uh, the shaft that we want to actually spin, you know, our our wheel or whatever our other device is. And so that's our shaft. And okay. So as we're looking at this, if we're in this configuration at this point, um, the uh, the north pole of the electromagnet is going to be attracted to the south pole of this permanent magnet. And similarly on the opposing side, right, this south pole is going to be attracted to this north pole, right? And so the electromagnet is going to rotate until it's aligned this way, right? Now, in this scenario, right, the ro motor's rotated sort of, you know, maybe 90 degrees, and then it stops. So what would we need to do in order to keep the motor spinning instead of just stopping at this point? Change the direction of the current. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we were to change the direction of the current going into the electromagnet, then you know it'd sort of be like all of a sudden we were like that. Just pretend I didn't rotate. I flip the colors around, right? And so now we've got a south pole opposing a south pole and a north pole opposing a north pole, and we're going to spin around again, and we'll be attracted right up until we get back to this point. So as we spin the electromagnetic electromagnet in the center, we've got to be switching the polarity of the current going into the, electro, going into the electromagnet so we can keep switching its poles in order to maintain the, you know, the spinning motion of the motor. Does anyone have any thoughts on um, how we would switch the direction, how, how we would switch the polarity of the electricity going into the electromagnet? Switch it around at the source using some sort of computer and or switch. Okay, switch it around. The so you could have a switch. Um, one of the challenges with a switch up until recently, which I'll talk about the, later, is that uh, these motors are spinning extremely fast, right? They're spinning thousands of RPM, thousands of rotations per minute, which means that you need to, you need to switch the current thousands of times per minute. Um, this is difficult for, uh, typically, for an older switch to maintain that switch rate and also to keep it synchronized, to do it um, in time. And so typically you don't have, in a brushed motor, the current direction switching, the polarity switching at the speed controller really rapidly. Instead, you're switching the polarity of the electricity right as it comes to the electromagnet. And uh, it's kind of hard for me to draw it, but um, I'm trying to think if there is a way to, to draw it here. So, um, uh, let's see. So, we can imagine that coming out of the um, electromagnet are the wires that are carrying the electricity in the electromagnet. So that's these, these wires right here. I'll take them orange. Okay. And let's see if I can do this correctly. Um,
want to do. May have this backwards. I'm just going to do this real quick, and then uh, I may have to flip it around. So let me see if I can get this right the first time. Okay. All right. Hopefully this is right. We'll see. Okay. So <clears throat> we've got these two wires that are coming off of the electromagnet. And you could think of it as, you know, this one here is the nominally the positive terminal. And this one is nominally the, the negative terminal. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one's which in the scenario. But let's say that when it's in this configuration, um, the, if this wire is connected to a positive here, so red is positive, and this one is connected to a negative one, uh, a negative uh, terminal. Then we've got the orientation of the coloring in the, uh, in, in, the, in the magnet that we have right now. So the north pole is here, and the south pole is in blue. As this spins, so we've got red on this end and blue on this end, or this wire. As we spin and start to line up now, with uh, this magnet, and we would normally stall, right? You'll see the switch where all of a sudden we've got a negative end on this wire and a positive end on this wire. So now we're going to flip the current around. And as we keep spinning, we stay blue on, the, on, the, on this side and red on this side all the way through until we get back to right about this point again. And you'll see now we'll switch again to, we'll switch the direction and so we'll switch the uh, polarity of the electricity going into the electromagnet right here as well, so we keep spinning. Does that drawing make sense, or does anyone have any questions about the drawing? Okay, so um, this is a crude approximation of what's actually happening inside of the inside of a brushed motor. You've got spaced around the cylinder of the motor these different electrical contacts that are configured in such a way that as the wires go around, uh, different ones, the wires come in contact with different polarity connections at different points in its rotation. And these wires that come out, uh, sorry. So in the way I've drawn it here, it's a bit strange. Uh, these wires here are actually, on most brushed motors, solid pieces of, um, of metal. These ones are pretty solid. And then what we call the brushes are actually these outer pieces here. So you've got to be able to make an electrical contact between this moving armature, oops, this moving armature here and the outside. And so you don't want to have like a really hard surface. And so instead you've got sort of these brush surfaces on the outside and then these solid wires come in contact with the brushes and slide along the brushes. And so that's where those motors get the uh, the name brush motor from is these, these outer brushes that you slide along in order to switch um, the, uh, the polarity electricity going in. 
Does anyone have any questions about that? Um, what are some of the things that you might think might cause problems in the brush motor? Heat? Fred, heat? So, yeah, sure. Uh, so there's, uh, there is heat generation. Um, particularly, there are, uh, there's a high resistance between the wire and the brushes um, because we don't have really great conduction between the two, we've got that gap. Um, so you have that contact resistance we talked about last time. And the energy that's lost in the contact resistance is going to heat, going to heat. So these, these motors do tend to heat up. Uh, what else? The brushes might Friction. wear down and then the motor wouldn't be usable. So it's kind of an extra failure point. Uh, yeah, correct. So um, you have a mechanical action here where the, the armature is rubbing up against, is physically rubbing up against the brushes and the brushes do degrade. So um, that's one of the reasons that people tend to swap out their sims pretty regularly on their drivetrain is that after it's been running for a certain number of matches, for example, the brushes have worn down. And so the uh, efficiency of the motor drops because you've got this mechanical wearing of the brushes. What else? Would it be a major power draw? Uh, yeah, I mean, just just like there's a heat generation, all the you know all the energy that's going into the heat isn't going into the motor, so you have a reduced motor efficiency. So some of your power is being wasted as opposed to going into spinning the motor. Your conversion rate when for a uh, brushed motor is about. Uh, what, what do you mean your conversion rate, Bobby? Oh, okay. I thought someone was saying same. But um, the conversion rate for a brushed motor is around only 70 to 80% for energy to actual motion, while a brushless motor is closer to 80 to 85% in conversion rate. Yeah, so the, the, the brushed motor, motor is, is substantially more efficient than the brushless motor. Any, anyone else have any other thoughts of potential problems? Just a comment. Um, because the motor has brushes, it's going to create more, it's going to move slower because it's going, have, going it's having to pass by all of those, whereas a brushless motor doesn't have that friction. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. So in addition to efficiency losses because of uh, electrical resistance, so also have efficiency losses because you're physically rubbing up against um, uh, material internal to the motor, so you've got friction inside the in, friction inside the motor. Yep. So there's a couple other things too. Um, depending on how the motors are manufactured, basically all brush motors have a preferred direction. So um, they'll be slightly more efficient spinning one direction than the other direction because of how the brushes are shaped internally. And so you'll find with drivetrains that use sim motors, for example, that that's one of the reasons why the robot's not just going to automatically go straight. Like even if your wheels and everything were perfect, because typically your drivetrain is mirrored, you've got the, the forward direction is usually reversed um, for one side versus the other side. And so, you know, 50% power to one side is going to result in a slightly different wheel rotation than 50% power to the other side. So there are some uh, differences in uh, the direction that they spin. And the other thing that's a bit of a problem is, um, particularly as the brushes start to wear, you get sparks that jump from the brush to the armature. And those sparks are a source of electrical noise as well. So in addition to the fact that you've got changing magnetic fields, which can induce a current in the wire, you also have electromagnetic fields that are given off by or, the re or tied to the sparks jumping the gap. And so um, brushed motors typically are considered uh, uh, to be noisier than, than brushless motors. Are there any questions about 
brush motors. Um, I'm just curious, yeah. is there any way to repurpose some of the heat um, to other, for um, other uses? Is it just too difficult? Um, I know some of it would become unavailable, but. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, on an FRC application, the answer, the answer is going to be no. Um, in real life, sure. Or I shouldn't say in real life, FRC is real life too. In certain applications, yes. So there are ways to do conversions between heat and electricity. Um, for heat at this lowish temperature, you typically use something called a Stirling engine um, in order to convert uh, heat to electricity. There's also some, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a particular class of metal alloys that will convert heat into electricity directly. Um, in all of those cases, both the Stirling engine and um, the, the, the special alloys, they're called thermoelectric, the alloys are called thermoelectrics. Um, the amount of power that you can get out of that conversion is very low, typically. Um, so you can't do a whole bunch with it, typically. Um, but it can be used for really low power devices, maybe maintaining a sensor or doing something like that. Um, so it's an, it's an active area of research. One of the things that uh, to keep in mind with any sort of idea about converting heat into electricity is that the amount of power that you can generate with that method is very highly dependent upon the difference in temperature between the heat source and the ambient temperature. And your ability to convert power is very low when you're only, you know, maybe 100 degrees Celsius at most above ambient. Um, you typically have very low power efficiencies, whereas if you have very large differences in temperature, you can get much higher efficiencies in how much power you can generate. That's one of the reasons that power plants um, try to go as hot as possible and typically are limited by the materials inside of them melting. Um, is usually their limit for how hot they can go. It's also why power plants are more efficient if in, say, Norway than they are in Florida. Um, there's actually a measurable efficiency gain by placing your power plant um, in, a, in a colder location than in a warmer location. Um, did that answer your question, Michael? Yes, thank you. Any other questions about brushed motors? Okay. So now all the rage are now brushless motors. And rather than trying to draw one, um, or maybe in addition trying to draw one, I have a video. Which, if I can, right here. Are you guys able to see the, the video? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so in a brushless motor, uh, the whole, I mean, as you might suspect, the idea is to get rid of the brushes. Um, in this scenario, the permanent magnet is actually on the rotating part, on the armature. So this would be the permanent magnet. And then you array electromagnets around the exterior. So the magnets you're going to be able to switch the poles of around the outside. Um, and then you basically have these sets of magnets. So in this configuration, which is pretty typical, you have six. So you've got uh, three pairs, so this is a pair, this is a pair, this is a pair, so you know, across the diameter of the, of the cylinder is a pair. And you are using switches to, exactly as someone mentioned at the beginning, switch the polarity of the electromagnets. And so as the motor is spinning, let me see, I don't know how much they show here. I think they're talking. <clears throat> 
uh, you will switch the polarity in. Oh, sorry. Okay, there we go. So now we now well, well, in this case they're not even switching the polarity. All they're doing is only one of the three uh, pairs is on at a time. So they've actually got these really nice plots, which is the other reason I like this video. So each one of these pairs, the A pair, B pair, and C pair, have their own plot of voltage with time. And so you can see when they're on, each pair is only on at a specific time. And so as the uh, armature in the middle is moving, we're using physical switches in order to switch the, oh, I guess you just switch the polarity at some point, to switch on different magnet pairs and also switch the polarities in order to generate that same motion that we talked about before where they're constantly chasing, you know, the attractiveness of the, of the, um, the permanent magnet and the electromagnet. Oh, I got a little thing. Uh, oh, I should have said that earlier. So the, the terminology for the armature on the inside is the rotor because it's rotating. And then the terminology for anything on the outside that's stationary is the stator. So the rotor rotates and the stator is stationary. Um, now, in order, does this, does this concept make sense of the electromagnets on the outside and then switching them on and off in order to, um, uh, in order to get the, the armature on the inside to move? Does anyone have any questions about that concept? Okay. Um, let's see what else do I want to talk about here. So, as we mentioned when someone uh, suggested that we switch these on and off, uh, the challenge comes in to number one, how do we switch the magnets on and off fast enough? And the answer to that one is really high performing transistors. And that's really one of the main ways that small um, brushless motors and small brushless motor controllers have become possible all of a sudden. So, you know, first is very much at the forefront right now in using brushless motors. The, the companies that are making the brushless motors for first are really some of the first, first companies to be making brushless motors at the size scale at a very commercial level. So this is all very brand new package technology. And then the other challenge that we have is how do we know when to do the switching? So does anyone have any thoughts of how the motor controller would know when the switch on and off the different electromagnets. Mm, you could take your encoder rate at which it spins and then run it through an equation to figure out how often do I have to switch the, uh, is the term electrodes or, or just how often do I have to switch it based on the measurement given by the encoder to gradually build in speed to a certain speed. No, just guess. Yeah, so it's pretty close. So, yeah, so Chris, pretty close. I mean, you can use the encoder position in order to know the position of the uh, armature on the inside of the rotor. And based off of the encoder position, you can then switch these magnets. Um, that's the reason that the NEOs and the Falcons and all the brushless motors require an encoder cable to function. Um, that should also tell you why when you unplug the encoder cable sometimes, um, it'll make it like maybe a quarter of a rotation before it freezes um, because it's spinning that first set before it needs to switch um, and then it will lock up. Um, the other thing that you can do, and I don't know as much about this process, is uh, typically at very high speeds, brushless motors can actually be controlled without an encoder. So um, there is there are all a bunch of electromagnetic fields and the electromagnetic fields inside of the brushless motor are changing. And they're changing as th their, uh, their configuration is dependent upon the physical configuration of the motor. So the magnetic field configuration is dependent upon the location of the, you know, the permanent magnet relative to the other magnets. And at high speeds, you can measure that and use that information to switch the, um, uh, use that information to switch the electromagnets. And that's a technique called backwards EMF. I'm not, I'd have to look, read more and see exactly how it works, but basically it's looking, it's reading the magnetic fields inside of the motor to
to know when to switch. Uh, my understanding is that really only works at fairly high speeds. Um, but it, when it is at high speeds, it works very well. I don't know if the Neos do this. I believe the Falcons do, where at, high, at low speeds, they are running using the encoder. And then at high speeds, they switch over automatically to backwards EMF in order to do the switching. Um, you know, one way we could test it, I guess, would be maybe if we like uh, used another booster motor to get the you know the Neo up to speed without the encoder motor. Could we get without the encoder wire? Could we get it to you know pick up where it left off or something? See if once we get it started, it would it would stay spinning. Um, <laughs> so that could be a little. I don't know if we want to do that with a Neo because they're expensive, but it'd be fun if they weren't expensive. Um, any questions about controlling? Uh, the switching for a brushless motor. Okay. Um, let me see what else. Uh, if you note, this are the you know the standard configuration is the set of six electromagnets in in three pairs. Those three pairs are our three phase wires, the red, black, and white wires that we have going into the coming out of the speed controller. So. You know, one of, you know, A might be the, you know, A, A, B, and C are the red, black, and uh, white wires going out of the, out of the spark speed controllers, for example. Those are those three phases. Um, and again, that's why if you get the phases wrong on the, uh, you, that's why if you get the phases wrong on the uh, uh, connection between the spark and the motor, again, you'll sort of get like a quarter of a turn. So they'll energize and the rotor will move, but then it will lock up because the wrong, uh, the wrong watch lines will be energizing. So you kind of hear a click um, on the Neos if you've got them backwards. As far as I know, it doesn't hurt them. Um, so it's kind of a nice debugging until you plug it in. You kind of hear that, that click as the shaft rotates maybe a quarter of a turn before it, before it locks up. Um, so here's a question for you. I just said that the smaller uh, brushless motors are are pretty new. Do you think that brushless motors overall are a new technology? No. No. Correct. In fact, brushless motors were some of the very first motors. So, in uh, say your vacuum cleaner. Your vacuum cleaner is running off of alternating current, which we didn't really talk about. But alternating current is by itself three phases. Um, and so versus our battery, which doesn't have any phases, it's direct current. And so you get the switching automatically for an, a motor that's running off of AC. Now, the switching is limited to uh, the, the, the switching the, um, the frequency of the power coming from the power plant, but uh, you get switching for free. And so you don't have to have these transistors to convert the DC power into essentially, you know, three phase alternating power at the motor. Um, so, you know, uh, a whole bunch of household appliances, um, uh, dryers, um, dryers, washing machines, vacuum cleaners, all of those kinds of devices that run, have a motor running off the AC are actually brushless motors or often are brushless motors. Um, it's just the miniaturization of the technology in order to get it working with DC power from a battery that's really uh, uh, been, been more recent. Um, do you guys have any questions about uh, brushless motors or, or brush motors? Um, I have a question. Um, so why would backwards EMS only f only work at higher speeds? Um, I would have to look to be sure, but uh, the my suspicion is so the way that you're going to measure the magnetic field is with another wire, and what you're going to be measuring is the induced current in that wire, and the magnitude of the induced current is proportional not to the magnetic field, but to the rate at which the magnetic field changes. And so my guess is that 
at higher speeds, you're having a, you're, so you're having your magnetic field is changing much more rapidly, and so you probably get a much larger induced current in your backwards EMF sensor, if you will. Um, and so I would expect that you get, you know, better signal to noise ratio at these higher speeds where the magnetic field is changing faster. So you're able to better detect the motor's position. I don't know that that's the case, but that is my best guess for uh, why it works best at high speeds. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, why would we use a brushed motor of, over a brushless motor? I'm just curious. Money. So, Michael, do you mean why would we use one or why did people used to use them? Um, no, I mean, why, current, why currently on a robot would we have a brushed motor if, because I believe that the brushless is the superior option. I may be incorrect about that. Yeah, so um, actually, I believe there's only one brushed motor on our robot this year, and it was there for legality reasons. Um, and that was the one on the V belt, because we were going to pair off that motor with another motor for to try and save motor ports. But yeah, I think this year we switched completely to brushless motors. Uh, most of the teams, I think, are going to switch to completely brushless motors. I think. I wouldn't even say five years from now. You know, my guess is that next year, people are not going to be running brushed motors, assuming they have the money to buy a brushless motor. There's really no reason to, to run a brushed motor when you have access to brushless motors. Wouldn't the reason be... be... Go ahead, Bobby. Um, one a reason to ha you have to use brush motors, maybe not having enough encoder ports. To run all the encoders through their brushless motors. I'm thinking real world circumstances. If you don't have encoders like that, that would probably be the reason you use the brush motors. So, in every case that I've seen, the uh, brushless motor controllers have an integrated encoder port. Um, so, the motor controller comes with a port. Uh, because the encoder value is so closely tied to the switching of the um, electromagnets. I don't think there'd ever be a situation where you would take the encoder value, run it to a computer, and then uh, send the data back from the computer back to the speech controller. I think that'd be too slow. I think in all those cases, you're going to see the encoder go, going directly to the speech controller to do the switching. Um, any other questions on this or any of the other electrical stuff that we talked about? Because we're going to Sort of take a break from electrical stuff for the rest of the time. Oh, see, Lindsay's got one here. Uh, do brushless motors heat up hot? How do brushless motor? How does brushless motor power need to, needed compared to brushed motor power? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, my understanding is that in general, brushless motors should be should run cooler than a brushed motor, and for the same amount of output power should require less electrical power. So you should be able to do the same amount of work to move your robot with less power. Now, what I've been seeing in real life, with the NEOs at least, is that because they're so efficient, or maybe because of how they're wound, it's not entirely clear, they seem to be drawing substantially more current than um, a brushed motor. That may have to do with the fact that since there's not as much internal resistance, um, they can basically accelerate faster. So you get a very large uh, uh, current draw. Um, you get a very large current draw at startup. Um, it, it's been a bit of an interesting thing. That's one of the reasons why in the code, we have to limit the ramp rates on how fast we can spin up the NEOs. Uh, because it seems like it's possible that we can spin them up so fast that basically we turn off the motor control. We draw so much current that the, the voltage across the entire voltage bus on the robot um, drops too low. So um, it's, I, I would say that for the same amount of work, they draw less power. But because we're asking them to do a lot more work, they're able to draw a lot more power. And we seem to be running into that problem. We seem to be able to draw more power than we're able to support with the current battery. Um, then as far as heating up, 
Uh, I saw some concerns with the Falcons heating up this year. We haven't run them ourselves, so I haven't gotten to see it. Part of that was because their internal limit on safety limit was set too low, so they were shutting themselves off a little bit too early. Um, I'm not sure whether or not they're actually having more or less heating problems. Um, something else to consider is all the technology is kind of new, and so people may have refined the design of the brushed motors more to remove heat versus the, the brushless motors, but I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. Does that answer your question, Lindsay? Yes. Oh, and I guess I should mention one other, uh, okay, one other issue with the brushless motors that people were finding um, right before competitions were starting was because there's so little internal resistance in the brushless motors, if you um, spin up your motor, your shooter motors to very high speeds and then disconnect the battery from the robot, the motor, the shooter motors turn into electric generators, which is normal for all motors. Um, but because there's no resistance, you get a very high voltage across the entire robot. And that voltage spike can damage the, the electronics. And so people were finding that if they turned off the robot with the power switch while their shooter was still spun up, they were frying all the electronic components on the robot instantaneously. And so um, Mars actually had that happen to them right before one of their events. And a couple of other people were reporting that problem too. So um, that's why we put out that note right before competition that um, you need to wait to wait for the robot to power, to wait for the shooter wheels to spin down before um, turning off the robot. Um, any, any final electrical questions? Okay, so uh, let's see. The next thing on our list is to go through some of the libraries. Um, what I will do is I'll let you guys kind of guide this one. So there's, you know, a ton of pieces of information um, that are a ton of different uh, functions that we could go over. Um, I'll sort of introduce them. If anyone wants to spend more time on one, let me know if anyone has any questions or whatever else to um, uh, so, so really engage and, and let me know where you want to go in terms of what you're interested in learning about, both the VIs that we have available and also the VIs that um, WPI has available too. Are there any questions or are there anything that people really want to see regarding the functions that we have in our toolbox or WPI before we start? So we're going to go ahead and start with uh, our toolbox of the eyes. So on Git, there is a project um, labeled, or there's a repository labeled toolbox, and anyone can clone it and look at it. Um, the sub VIs that are located in the toolbox have a couple of things in common. So number one, they are as standalone as possible. So with only a few exceptions, they don't have any global variables inside of them. They don't have any other um, sort of dependencies that would prevent you from using one in, in your code just by dropping in the sub-VI. Um, and then the other thing is I've made sure that all of the uh, VIs that um, are in here uh, have been commented. And I've also gone through and added, if you, if you go into the help, there's help for each one of these VIs too to explain at least a little bit about how to use them. So anything in this toolbox um, sort of meets those, at least those basic criteria. And the caveat to that or the corollary to that is if we want to add other VIs to this uh, toolbox, we want to make sure that they're really clean and really well commented and really well documented before we add them. Um, so if there's VIs you want to add there, uh, we need to make sure we do that process first. Um, so this is a little bit more extensive than maybe the last time you guys looked. So uh, I went ahead and last week added some, but not all 
of the VIs that I think are applicable from this year and clean them up and add some comments and, and documentation. So there's a little bit more um, than what we had had before. So I'm just gonna go down this list and show a little bit about them and then uh, stop me if you wanna talk more, more about them. So the first one that we have here is acceleration limit. Uh, oh, and the other thing that I got, it, other thing I did is most of them have some sort of icon. Uh, they've all got a little decoration box around the, the inputs and outputs just so you make sure that all of your controls and everything are, are located here. If you go to help and you hover over the icon, you'll see a description of everything that's going into it as well as a description of what is going into the, uh, how the VI operates. So um, this VI is uh, was developed last year to prevent the robot from tipping if the driver pressed forward on the stick really fast with the elevator extended. So it takes a raw number, which usually is a joystick value, and uh, prevents it from accelerating or decelerating faster than a certain amount. So if you immediately go from zero to one on the joystick, you can say that I only want to be able to go to zero to one, not instantaneously, but I want you to gradually get there over a period of say two seconds. So you can set um, uh, you can set the both the acceleration and a deceleration, a max acceleration and a max deceleration limit. Um, uh, yeah, so basically allows you to ramp an input value. Um, Typically, typically we used it for to ramp a, a joystick value before going to a motor. Any questions on that block? Okay. The next one is one that we were working with in the swerve drive code. I just clean up a little bit. So this angular distance VI is uh, one that takes as an input an angle between negative infinity and positive infinity. Um, actually, I think about it, I might have to change that. Uh, yeah, this actually needs to be, sorry, zero to 360. It was in the help, but not here. So the goal angle between zero and 360, and then it can accept any format for the current angle and it calculates the signed angular distance between those uh, two angles. So um, that's used for these azimuth motors on the swerve drive. It's used for um, turning an autonomous, pretty much any, anywhere where we need a PID loop and, uh, and rotation. Any questions on that VI? Um, the auto parameter parser is one that we looked at in the auto code. This is the one that takes any of your arguments from the text file and extracts a single value. So if you've got, you know, the, if you've got multiple parameters, like one of them is how far the robot's going to drive, the other one's, you know, how much power it's going to use, um, it'll extract each one of those one at a time. And this is that VI that you string together in the series in order to extract different, uh, different parameters. Any questions on that one? The blink light VI isn't one that we've talked about. Um, this one's kind of, it's not too exciting. Uh, basically, it's just going to generate a on off pulse at a certain interval. So you can tell it to um, be, you know, be true for half a second and false for half a second, true for half a second, false for half a second. Uh, we used it to blink lights on the dashboard last year. I don't know that we're using it for anything this year. Uh, you can, of course, use it to blink other things. If you want to turn something on and off, and you just want to have it cycle, you can use it for that too. Any questions there? Okay. Uh, one thing you'll notice here is that instead of using a sub VI for rising edge trigger or a sub VI for a toggle, even though we have those, uh, I've, we've made it so that there's no sub VI in here. That way, there's no dependencies. So you don't have to download both sub VIs in order to use this sub VI. So that's another thing that we're trying to keep in the toolbox is that 
you don't need multiple sub VIs to get any one sub VI to work. So trying to re reduce the number of dependencies between between uh, pieces of code. Um, the button color chooser is one that we have not talked about yet. It's one that we would talk about if and we go through any of the dashboard code. Uh, basically, this configures the colors of the buttons on the driver station on the dashboard. So uh, green for currently being pressed, gray for that button is being disabled by something in the code, and then you can uh, externally set the color for when it's not pressed. So um, you don't, you'd set that color to something that you know, groups things together, like all the hatch buttons would be yellow and all the cargo buttons would be orange. Uh, it just allows you to, to switch the colors that way. Any questions on that one? Um, convert percentage. <clears throat> excuse me. Convert percentage to degrees. <clears throat> uh, that one is uh, well, again one that we talked about in the swerve track code, where we do the conversion from the raw potentiometer value from the azimuth encoder um, to a degrees between negative 180 and positive 180 degrees. Um, that's just <coughs> excuse me. That's just grabbed directly from the swerve code. <coughs> we have um, uh, our custom PID codes, which we went through in a lot of detail in the PID lessons. Um, this is the one that we worked with. Version 2.1 has some bugs in it, so I would not use 2.1. Uh, I am planning out currently a 4.0. So if anyone is interested in working with me on making a 4.0 version of the ID code, um, let me know, and uh, we'll we'll work out some time to some time to work over Zoom for for making a making a, an updated version of the PID algorithm. Any questions or comments on that one? Okay. Yeah, just uh, let me know if anyone's interested in in really diving into uh, PID code and making a more robust one for future use. Um, the edge trigger is very similar to the VIs that you've been, the code that you've been making and playing around with in both the challenge number one and uh, um, the first couple of lessons that we did. It incorporates a rising edge trigger, a falling edge trigger, and also a any edge trigger. So can drop that one block and use uh, and, and and use any of the triggering um, any of the any of the triggers. Any questions on that? Um, error latch is a new one in this year. So uh, this one's for error handling. So if we've got any any errors on the robot, we've been dropping this block in there. So if say the an error triggers once, um, you may want to make it so that error is latched until you reset it. So you could imagine a scenario where say a, say a motor overheats. In that scenario, you could either want it so that you only get a warning on the driver station when the motor is too hot. So in which case you don't have to do anything special. But in another case, you might want it where as soon as the motor gets over the temperature, you trigger the error. And then even if the motor drops below the triggering temperature, you stay, you, you keep having that error message on the driver station until the drivers clear it. So depending on what option you want, you can do either of those. Um, uh, this VI handles safety overrides and also the ability to clear errors. Now you'll notice that we have this, I, I, we have this thing called placeholder here. <clears throat> so this VI is designed to work with global variables um, because we don't want to have conflicts when we download the code and put it in a new LabVIEW project. I've replaced the global variables with just local variables. And so the idea would be that you download this function, you put it into your project, and then uh, you insert the appropriate global variables 
uh, and then continue using it inside the project. Um, can everyone still hear me? I think a whole bunch of videos just dropped out. Is everyone still there? We're good. You are. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any questions on the error latching? The next one we have is error message builder. So this is one that we'll cover in the dashboard code if we get to it. So um, this takes in a bundle of uh, so this is this is this is the this is basically formatting the, the information before it goes to the um, text to speech code. So you know we've got Karen. Uh, we have to tell Karen what to say. This handles all the formatting for this text to speech. So, as an input, it has a bundle of the error messages for Karen to, to, to speak, whether or not to say that error message, and then how long to wait before saying that error message again. So, um, this accepts an array of bundles. So you can put in multiple arrays, uh, multiple error messages, and it will handle the formatting before going on to the, the text to speech code. Any questions here? We have the uh, field-oriented uh, conversion code, which we looked at in the Square Drive lectures. Um, so that is also uh, located here. <clears throat> we have interpolate calibration value, which is another new one from this year. So this assumes that we're reading a CSV file off of the RoboRio, and it takes as an input the data from the CSV file and then uh, an input value, and it uses linear interpolation in order to uh, estimate that. So we would use this to um, uh, get the value off of the pressure transducer or um, get the correct uh, shooter speed based off of the distance away from the target. So anywhere that we're using a CSV calibration file, uh, and we need to get a, a value out of it. Any questions on this one? Um, pulse output was one from last year that was focused, that was made for the hatch intake. Um, basically, you can um, pulse a, uh, uh, a Boolean true value for a set amount of time. So you can say, extend this piston for, you know, 250 milliseconds and then retract it. So um, this one's a little bit, but it was one from from last year specifically for the hatch. Um, I've gone ahead and brought in the pure pursuit algorithm. So this is what one of the things we would cover if we were to do the pure pursuit um, lecture where we talk about how the robot follows a path on autonomous. This is uh, the part of the code that handles actually identifying the next point. Um, this is the part of the code that actually has the robot chase uh, the, the moving point on the path. So it's not all of the pure pursuit algorithm, but it's the, it's the core of the pure pursuit algorithm. Any questions on this one? Um, we have a read CSV block. So this one again is designed to read a CSV file off the robot. Typically, those we're using those for uh, calibration files. And its format is designed to work with the interpolation um, block. And then it also has error handling. So if you try and read a CSV file that doesn't exist, um, it, won't just, it won't just break the code. It'll uh, directly handle that error so that you don't have anything too catastrophic happen. Um, any questions on that one? We have the state selection VI. Um, we talked about state machines in uh, one of the earlier um, sessions. We actually built this exact algorithm in that earlier session. Um, this is just a formalized 
in uh, uh, formalized in the sub uh, Ethan's dropping in and out. Is anyone else dropping in and out, or is it just Ethan? Maybe it is just Ethan, Ethan. is there. Um, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, he messaged. He, he says he's, he's just like he says he's periodic. I keep hearing someone go in and out. I think that is Ethan. Um, I've been watching the. I just hear the noise. Um, uh, yeah, so this state selection block converts um, uh, a set of buttons, typically from the dashboard, or but it could also be from a joystick, into a set of, into a specific um, robot state output. Um, any questions about this? Again, this one is, if you want to go back and watch those lectures, we, we, we create this, uh, this block here. Okay. Um, next one are some more SWIR specific ones. Um, I won't go into, I won't open them all up. Uh, these are ones that we talked about in the SWIR, um, in the SWIR lesson, lesson. So choosing the correct angle out of the four possible options is that block. Um, doing the rotation scaling on the joystick axis and doing the straight scaling. I've also been turning the blocks. You'll notice I don't have a uh, swerve math here in the toolbox. Um, that's because that one still needs to get cleaned up a little bit and commented and documented. So um, if anyone wants to take that on, maybe Alex, since she wrote it, uh, then we can drop that into the toolbox. The, I would like to be able to drop in all of the Swerve stuff into the toolbox so when we upload it for other people to use or us to use in the future, you can sort of create a Swerve drive just by dragging and dropping um, uh, pre-created sub BIs and connecting them together. Um, <clears throat> the next one that's not Swerve is Test Actuator Interlock, which is Amelie's favorite. So this is the way that we're handling test code now. So in order to test an individual actuator, we place this block um, between the state controller value and the output to the motor. And uh, it allows us to uh, switch from using the state controller logic in the main code to being able to directly specify the motor power or the solenoid position from the test, test uh, um, block on the uh, dashboard. This is another one that requires or is designed to work with global variables. So you drop it into your project and replace um, these two local variables with the appropriate uh, global variables. Are there any questions about this one? Um, here we have the text to speech code. I did not write this, I found this online. Um, and uh, this is what takes the formatted string from the error message builder and converts it into uh, Karen's voice. Um, we have uh, time to threshold or time threshold. So what this, <clears throat> what this block does is if you, you put in, um, you put in the current value and then you put in some threshold value and it automatically starts clocks for the amount of time that the value has, the current value has been above a certain threshold, and the amount of time that they, uh, <coughs> the value has been below a certain threshold. So, you know, if you want to say, start a timer for, you know, how long has the shooter been up to speed for, um, this is a good way to do that. And it's sort of already uh, written for you automatically. This is another one that could do with some uh, enhancements. Um, it'd be nice to go ahead and integrate a comparison so you get a Boolean if it you know, you exceeded a certain uh, threshold time. Um, you could handle the resets a little bit better. There's some other options that we could do um, to improve the, the functionality of this block. Um, we've got uh, toggle. Um, this uh, toggles a value, so if you put in one Boolean value and then you, if you put in a button, you can toggle between, as you press the button, it'll toggle between true and false. So 
if you want to have a toggle for something that's already built. And again, we wrote uh, this code in one of the earlier lessons. Are there any questions on this one? Okay. So um, this is called a malleable VI. We have not covered those. Um, <coughs> it's the only malleable VI that we're currently using. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about what a malleable VI is, but you can think of the malleable VI as adapting to the input type. So this VI, even though it's shown as um, taking a Boolean value as input, you can also put in an integer, a floating point, a string, um, a, a file name probably. You can put in almost any uh, you can put in almost any data type and this one will work. And uh, we use this block in order to um, check for changes in the value. So what this is going to do is it's going to look at whatever value you've input, whatever data format you've input, and uh, provide a true value when that value changes. Um, we use this to uh, reduce the bandwidth on the CAN bus, for example. Uh, so we only send values to the CAN bus when they change. And we do a similar thing when we send data to and from the dashboard. So we only send data when over Ethernet when, um, uh, when the value actually changes. Are there any questions on that? Okay. And then the last one is while dry version five. So this was the version of wild drive that was developed after IRI last year, and it's one that's currently running on Valkyrie. And um, it has a whole bunch of stuff, including support for driver profiles and a whole bunch of different tuning operations to support the different turning modes that are available in um, in in a butterfly in a butterfly type drive system. Um, particularly, it's designed to help allow the driver to drift and drift effectively. Are there any questions about that one? Okay. Are, so, um, really, all I want to, you know, I don't expect anyone to be an expert on all of these. Uh, my intention here was to sort of give you an overview so you know what is available to you as you start to, you know, develop your own pieces of code. You sort of know that you don't have to recreate, reinvent the wheel. You can go back and see um, what code's already written for you. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments on any of the VIs in our toolbox? Okay. Um, and yeah, one of the things I'd like to do this summer is update some of these, include some more of the swerve code, include some more of the autonomous code in here, um, and also upgrade particularly the PID code in, in particular. That's the main one I'm thinking about upgrading this summer. So if anyone has a particular interest in working on any of the toolbox stuff, the documentation, or writing the new code, um, let me know and, uh, and we can work on that together. Okay, so uh, the next thing to talk about is what WPI, which is Wor Worcester Polytechnic Institute, um, has in store for us. So, for those of you who don't know, Worcester Polytechnic Institute is a university um, just outside Boston in, in Worcester, Massachusetts. And since the beginning of at least 2009, they've been responsible for writing the first code in LabVIEW, uh, particularly. And so they have a WPI robotics library that includes a lot of the functions that we use. Pretty, pretty commonly um, in order to work with the robot. And I thought it would be kind of nice to go through and <clears throat> go through these in some detail uh, so people can, again, sort of just get an overview of it and see what's available to work with um, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, before I get started, does anyone have any questions or, or particular things they want to see in the library? Okay. So um, the first set of items we have are the robot drive items. 
uh, we don't use many of these. Um, these are sort of set up for the uh, default code um, to get people off the ground and moving pretty quickly. Uh, we pretty much bypass all of these drive systems. Um, the one reason that we may want to know how to, the one reason to maybe know how to use these is when we're going out to help other teams, um, this is often what they're using. I know Amelie had to very quickly learn how to use these when she was helping that team at Little Rock um, because uh, they were using these UIs which we weren't, we weren't used to using. So um, getting some experience with these is probably not a, not a bad idea, um, but we don't typically use them. Um, any questions on that? On that note? Um, in motor control, we do sort of use these. Uh, so we do use the motor opens and closes and set outputs and stuff. That's sort of how we bypass these blocks up here. So, you know, these, these blocks are sort of collections of these uh, blocks that you use to directly command individual motors. Um, we sort of go around them and just directly command the motors so we can make sure we understand what's going on and we're, we're handling all the logic ourselves. Um, apparently, if you click this folder, it'll jump you to these folders. I'll show you a different way to get to these. That's a little bit easier, but these are uh, specific uh, uh, folders of sub-BIs for CTRE products and Rev Robotics products. Um, <clears throat> the next folder we have are joysticks. So these ones are pretty simple. Uh, we use them a lot. Uh, these allow us to read values from the joysticks uh, or really any USB device that's recognized as a joystick. Um, I've never messed around with mapping the axis. Oh, this one's designed to work with um, some of the robot drive stuff that we don't normally use. Um, and then the other thing you've got here is set output. So you can also send signals back to the joysticks. Uh, the only ones I've used on this and as far as I know, that we've used are to set the rumble, so you can turn the rumble on and off in the joystick. I don't actually know what, is, there's a Boolean array here for outputs. I would assume that maybe that's like lights on the joystick, but I've never, I've never seen anyone play around with that. So if anyone wants to play around with that and let me know, that'd be cool. Uh, I guess some joysticks maybe have lights or something else you can turn on and off. Um, Any questions on the joystick sub BIs? Okay. Um, next one is sensors. And I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail right here because the next lesson that we have is going to be on sensors. Um, and we're going to talk about all these different sensor types. Um, but the ones that are available here, they already have some code written to help with are gyroscopes, which we mostly don't use anymore. Well, we pretty much use inertial measurement units now. Uh, encoders, which um, we do use, but most of the encoders that we use are integrated into the speed controllers, so we're not directly reading them off of the Rebel Rio very often. Um, potentiometers, which we're using things that act like potentiometers for the azimuth encoders on the swerve drive. Um, switches, so those could be physical switches, dip switches, limit switches, magnetic limit switches, anything that's either open or closed. Um, accelerometers, again, uh, mostly we grab this information from an inertial measurement unit now, but it is exactly what you'd expect. It measures the acceleration um, of the robot. One thing is, okay, it's not here. Um, the Robo Rio actually has a built-in accelerometer as well. We attempted to use the built-in accelerometer on the RoboRio last year to detect tipping, but that did not quite work. Um, counters, I don't know that I've really ever used a counter for this. Um, let's see. Yeah, so my understanding is that the RoboRio has one built-in counter that allows you to count at a very high uh, count frequency. 
Oh, no, I see. Oh, interesting. Okay. <clears throat> so I, mean, I can just, let me describe this. So um, the Robo Rio has a number of different ports. So it's got analog ports and it's got digital input ports and some other ones. Um, the digital input port, if you were to just read the digital input port, which is this set of blocks right here, um, you would be limited to reading that digital input port at a rate that is uh, that, that is tied to how fast your loop is looping. So if your loop is looping, say, once every 20 milliseconds, um, you're only going to be able to read the, the digital input port once every 20 milliseconds. Now, there are scenarios where the value of the digital input port might be changing much more rapidly than once every 20 milliseconds. So, for example, if you have an encoder hooked up directly to the Robo Rio, um, or if, you know, I don't know, you, you tap against a wall really fast. And so you're worried about being able to catch all of those on off signals using the computer because the computer is not running fast enough. And so built into the Robo Rio are some specialty circuits called counters. And they're going to take uh, the value from the digital, you can map a digital input port to a counter and it will count those pulses for you. And then every 20 milliseconds, you'll read the counter value. So, you know, you read it one time, maybe it says five, and another time it says eight. So in between your two reads, the digital input port has gone on and off three times. And so the counters kept track of that at a very high frequency for you. And then you're just reading the counter at the lower, the lower loop time. Does, does anyone have any questions about uh, the idea behind counters and why you might need them? Okay. Um, so built into the encoder code is probably these are the exact same, but if I just wrap it around it to work with the encoders. Um, you've got ultrasonic sensors. I'm not sure what's special about the ultrasonic sensors here versus just reading from an analog port. Um, I think it just does a range conversion for you. And we'll talk about that um, some in the next session. Uh, and then third party, again, jumps you to uh, um, CTRE sensors specifically, which we'll cover separately. Are there any questions about the sensors power? Okay. Um, next thing is actuators. Um, so here we've got a number of different options. <clears throat> if we go to motors, um, we have these are the same uh, folder that we were in before when we went through the drive control and the down to motor. So that's sort of one thing to keep in mind with the way LabVIEW pallets are set up. There's multiple ways to get to the same folder. Um, you, can, you can take multiple paths and end up in the same folder. So these are, these are the, the motor, motor control code that we do use to directly control each motor. And these, are the, these are the ones that we tend to use. Um, we also have some options for servo control. So um, setting the position of servo motors over the PWM ports. Um, some of you may know that we have a um, linear actuator uh, that we got for the cow just before we had to stop meeting. That one behaves as a servo, but does not work directly with the servo controllers um, that first is provided. So uh, we're actually having to write our own uh, servo control algorithms in order to get that servo data linear actuator to work properly. And we have not finished that yet. Um, relays uh, are switches. So they are they turn a motor on or off. Um, they used to be used because A, speed controllers were really expensive, and B, speed controllers um, were used to be really, really big. And the relays were cheaper and smaller. I don't know that I've seen any advanced teams using a relay in the last five years for anything. You also have to use, you have to use relays to control pneumatics. Um, relays have pretty much been, been replaced with uh, small speed controllers and with uh, with with the solenoids that we put on the saw on the on the manifolds, if they've been pretty much replaced. Um, <clears throat> uh, speaking of relays, we have solenoids. Um, 
these are set up to control specifically the solenoids on the um, uh, for pneumatics, although they can be used to control any solenoid. And uh, just as a point of clarification, a solenoid, even though we say solenoid, we mean a valve that switches the airflow. Technically, the solenoid is actuating the valve of the pneumatics. Uh, the actual solenoid is a little actuator that um, has a little electromagnetic coil around it. And when you energize the coil, the actuator moves between two positions. Um, and we use them to control airflow, but you can actually use electric solenoids for, for other things too. Um, uh, controlling the compressor, uh, that's pretty straightforward. This one set up just to control the compressor. It does expect that the compressor is being controlled through the pneumatics control module in the, in the electrical system. Um, and then again, third party jumps you to a CQRE solder. Are there any questions on the uh, uh, actuator palette? Okay. Next, we have IO or input output. These are more low level ways of reading sensors and controlling actuators. Everything that we've seen in the sensors and actuators block makes the pallets makes use of these sub VIs. They're all wrapped on top of them. Uh, if we're in a situation where we need to control or control something or read something that um, isn't supported directly by first, they've given us these options to create our own code to do this. So we are, for instance, having to use these blocks to control the uh, linear actuator for the cow. So um, digital input directly, re directly reads uh, values off of the digital input ports on the RoboRio. I have not messed with any of these filtering options. So I have to look more into to seeing what, they're, what they handle. Um, my guess is they're probably to handle bouncing. So one of the problems with um, uh, uh, digital lines and sometimes they'll bounce. So you'll get like, when you try and click once, you'll get like a couple of rapid clicks before you settle on a, on a click. I guess if some of these are debouncing filters. I'm not positive on that. Um, you can also actually do digital outputs. So if you wanted to turn something on or off by setting a digital output, the RoboRio does support that. Uh, I haven't really seen that used for anything and in recent time, although I guess you could, huh, I guess you could build your own PWM controller using just your digital pins. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but apparently you can. Um, there's another class of uh, operations, of uh, functions that will allow you to generate your own pulse of modulation signals. Um, they also added this here, the ability to use the PWM protocols that are common for a lot of LEDs. Uh, Ethan ordered those, and I, I Assume maybe we they got here. I actually don't know. Um, those are the LEDs that we were going to switch to um, for Smoky Mountains. Um, that way we could directly control them with the PWM port and bypass the need for the Blinken, um, which would uh, save us some weight. And Ethan says that those those LEDs did arrive. So whenever we get back to the shop, we can we can play around with, with using those uh, those controllers. And this is a brand new thing actually. It's required a firmware update to the RoboRio in order to uh, allow this to be possible this year. Um, I am not sure. I'm not sure what duty cycle this is referring to. I don't know if this is like the global duty cycle for the entire RoboRio FPGA or what. Um, I'm not sure what these ones do. <clears throat> uh, analog input, again, a lot of the sensor uh, VIs that we looked at were wrapped around these. Uh, you, it allows you to get um, uh, read analog values. Uh, oh, Alex asks, totally random question, but did the magic service help? Uh, yeah, the magic service did get that team programmed um, at uh, Little Rock. I have not heard from Bravo whether or not, um, from Daniel, whether or not um, uh, and I was able to do anything useful with it. I'll, 
I'll text I'll text Daniel maybe here this weekend and ask him if he ever heard back from his friend and I. Um, accumulators would be useful if you were basically building your own gyroscope. So um, if you had a gyroscope or sorry an accelerometer uh, and you wanted to plug the accelerometer directly into an analog port and convert that anal that accelerometer value into a gyroscope. Uh, I guess theoretically you could do it with an accumulator built in the Robo Rio. I've never used this before. Um, we can talk some in the next session about the difference between accelerometers and gyroscopes and how this might be useful. Um, advanced. Uh, looks like some more filtering options for the analog channels. Um, Oh, okay. Um, we can also talk about some of the sensors about how analog sensors, so an analog sensor at some point, even though the value could be anything, has to be converted into a digital number at some point. Um, and so apparently you have some additional control with how you convert the analog signal into a digital signal once it gets to the real Oreo. Um, let's see. Analog output, um, <clears throat> you can sort of vary from zero to five volts or zero to three point three volts, the analog outputs in the Robo Rio. I'm not sure what that'd be useful for, um, but it's an option. And I'm wondering if this is, yeah. So hey, Ethan, this, you know, we talked about setting up a converting the, um, uh, uh, converting the ultrasonic sensor into a digital signal, this would sort of do that for you, although it wouldn't, the whole point of us doing was to save an analog port, this would still use an analog port. So it wouldn't really help us, but if for whatever reason you had an analog sensor and you didn't want to build your own circuit, you could convert it to a digital sensor. Um, typically we've done that just in code. Uh, there are some you know, basically, basically saying, you know, if it's over this voltage, it's true, and if it's under this voltage, it's false. There are some <clears throat> electrical reasons why it would be more robust to do this um, on the actual analog input bus uh, as opposed to in code. Um, I don't know that we've ever been in a situation where it was that critical, but <clears throat> it looks like that option is supported. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice here. No, um, are there any questions? I know these ones are sort of very low level nitty gritty. Are there any questions on these input output operations? Um, I'm going to skip over third party for a second. Uh, driver station. Um, this one is mostly getting data from, so this is not the dashboard. This is the driver station that first controls. So there's blocks to start communication. This is how you can, so if the field management system sends us data about what alliance we're on, what position we're in, like if we're in R1, R2, or R3 in the driver stations, whether it's a practice match or a qualification match, uh, the match number, whether or not the matches are replaced, all that information is also accessible to us. So if we want to change our LED colors based on our alliance or change some information and some setting based off of our driver position, um, we can do that. Um, yeah, this one just checks to say whether or not uh, the robot's disabled. Um, this one will tell us whether or not we're running in a real match or a practice match. So if we're running at the shop, FMS doesn't, isn't attached. So um, It'll tell us whether we're running at the shop or on the field. If you wanted to change something for those two, two things, I really would not recommend having code be different depending on whether you're running in a, at home or at the at, at a, in the match. But uh, that's an option. Um, this one will tell you whether or not you've been disabled. Um, could be useful if you want to change how your robot, you know, handles like say sensor values or any logic if the robot's been disabled. This one we do use. So this one will tell us how much time is remaining in the match. We use this for the countdown timer. 
on the uh, uh, on the dashboard. Theoretically, you could also use this um, in autonomous, like if you wanted your autonomous to do something no matter what when there was one second left, you could, you know, abort your autonomous mode early if you were one second away from the end of the match, end of the autonomous mode. And then uh, this block, so um, some years, there'll be additional information that FMS will provide and you can read that. So um, I think this year, that might be what, uh, I think the only thing they're sending back this year is once the control panel is spun, it will say which position uh, you need to put place the control panel at. Um, and so this, uh, uh, this like the random selection for where to where to locate the color. Um, this one, uh, uh, this block will I think tell you that information. But this varies by year, so different years have different information sent sent back as game data. Um, any questions on the driver station power? Uh, the next one is network tables. So uh, network tables are how we send information back and forth between all of our uh, internet devices. So between the Robo Rio and the dash, the driver station, between the Robo Rio and the dashboard, between the Robo Rio and the dashboard, and everything in the limelight or any other IP cameras. Um, you can sort of think of it as a network table as a, I guess I'd say like a, a file folder that everyone on the network has access to. So anyone on the network can place a value into the file folder and anyone uh, elsewhere in the network can also, you know, view that value that's in the file folder. So it's a, it's a common location where everyone can read information and everyone can also write information. Um, so there's a whole bunch of blocks for uh, sending those data um, back and forth between um, or writing and reading information from the, from the network table. You don't, explicitly send or receive data, you, you write and read off the network table. Um, I haven't used, I, I mostly been using, mostly using write and read. I don't know if we've messed around much with any of the more advanced blocks. Um, so I couldn't comment on some of the more advanced things. Uh, yeah, I'd have to look more into these to know what options we have, but there's the potential for, um, sending and receiving some more information uh, uh, from the dashboard that might be useful. Any questions on the dashboard um, uh, palette? Okay. Next we have camera. I'm not even gonna talk about this. Um, this is blocks for using camera data on the Robo Rio. So that'd be us grabbing uh, camera information and processing, processing on the Robo Rio. I strongly recommend that we do not do this. Um, pretty much everyone's applications that you use, a camera mounted to a secondary processor that does all the computation and then you just send the results of the processing back to the Robo Rio. Um, the Robo Rio is not super great at processing the data. It uses a lot of the, the CPU power. So I've been trying to get away from that. Um, communications, uh, this is where some of the different serial connections that we have on the Robo Rio, um, like we want to talk to an I2C connection like Alex was talking about, or some of these other protocols, uh, we have those built in. I have not messed with these on the Robo Rio. I've messed with them on other systems but not the Robo Rio specifically, but um, you know, if we look here in their ITC, um, uh, let's see, or actually, I think Alex, you're using just a serial port. So you can see Alex, you've got like a baud rate setting and everything. So you can set up the serial communication that you're running on the Arduino, you could do that here for the Robo Rio. So that's where these blocks are located. Um, and then another, the other serial communication that we do use frequently is the CAN bus. Um, we haven't needed to do anything crazy here. Uh, all of the devices that we've been putting on the CAN bus have first supported VIs, but if we had another CAN enabled device, like a sensor that first doesn't directly support 
um, we could talk to it over the Canvas uh, directly using using these you guys. Um, so I expect that with the you know the the Husky lens and maybe some other sensors that we're exploring, uh, we're going to be spending some more time in the communications palette for these serial communication protocols. Um, any questions on that palette? Um, utilities, uh, let's see if there's anything in here. So this is, you know, measuring time from a certain start point on the RoboRio booting. Uh, I've never messed with using interrupts on the RoboRio. I don't even want to comment on exactly how you integrate those because I've not used interrupts in this processor topology. So I'll hold off on commenting on that. And then I've never even looked in this palette before. Um, I'm not sure. I have to spend some more time to see what this one is doing. It looks like some direct access to the FPGA itself. Um, it'll tell you the software versions. Uh, this one is this one's useful. So we started using this one this year. So uh, you can put a message into here, like any sort of string, and it will send that message to the uh, little error message box in the uh, on the driver station. So uh, we've been doing that for some of our status updates now, so that even if the screen recording doesn't work. Uh, it'll still be in the log. So the log on the driver station will keep a memory of all the messages that you sent, which is useful. And there's actually a button on the RoboRio that doesn't do anything. It says user. Uh, you can read that button on the RoboRio. It's like a physical button. It's next to the reset button. I, I don't know what you would use it for, um, but uh, if you wanted to read that, that physical button, you have that option. Any, any questions on the utilities? And then under power, um, we have some really useful ones that I kind of want to use more of. So uh, we can get things that we do now, you can get all of the current, current draws off the PDP. You can also identify if any of your snap action breakers have tripped. Um, you can get the voltage of the PDP. You can get um, whether or not uh, uh, the RoboRio has a problem, like if it's got a, a failure on the 5 volt rail like we've had whether or not there's issues with um, the PCMs or the VRMs or anything like that. Um, they're all really useful. Like I think I think there's actually a wealth of knowledge here, wealth of information that we could be sending back to the driver station. We just need to spend some time to package this into a nice little package that sends information in a way that doesn't just overwhelm the drivers um, with information. So uh, this sort of needs to be packaged into a way that, that works with us. But, Potentially, it would let us know if motors failed or if a snap action breaker blew up or um, any of those kinds of issues or if we're drawing too much current. But right now, we're still only using this in, in sporadic locations on a case by case basis. Um, any, any other questions on this? Okay. I'll try and uh, finish up pretty quickly here. I'll just jump over to the the last one, which is the third, third, third party code. Again, I'm just sort of trying to give you guys an overview of what's available so you know what you, know, what you can work with. So we've got two third party, third party pieces of code. Um, anything that's in third party does have to get installed separately. So when you install LabVIEW, uh, you won't have these two folders. There are instructions along with um, the, uh, the LabVIEW install instructions on the um, Google Drive for how to install these third-party libraries. And other companies have them too. The only ones that we have installed right now are CTRE and REV because they're the only ones that, that we needed them for. We go into CTRE, um, you'll see uh, uh, folders for each of their different motor controllers as well as some of their different sensors. Uh, if we went into, say, the town SRX block uh, folder, there's actually a lot here. So there's everything that we need to uh, uh, open a reference for the motor, um, configure the different motor settings, like whether or not it's in brake or coast mode, 
whether or not it's inverted or not inverted. Anything that we need to send commands to that motor. Um, you can do a whole bunch of other stuff that we've not really played around a whole bunch with. So a lot of really nitty gritty about how to change the performance of the motor and exactly the behavior. Uh, any of the integrated sensors that can be plugged into the sensor port on the town SRX. Um, typically we've been using encoders and limit switches, but uh, there's some other options for what else can get plugged into the Talon. Um, the, the Talon uh, does closed loop control, so you can run a PID loop on the Talon itself. This is something that we've been doing on the Sparks for the shooter motors, but we've never actually done it with the Talons. One of the things that it also has is these motion profilers. This is one of the ways that people do autonomous without a pure pursuit algorithm. Um, uh, I don't know that I would recommend us trying to do this for autonomous. Um, we can talk more if we do that session on pure pursuit with the advantages and disadvantages of motion profiling versus pure pursuit R. Uh, one case where I have seen pure pursuit that's promising to me is, or not pure pursuit, sorry, motion profiling is for things like an elevator. You could do a motion profile to improve the responsivity of your elevator. So you'd still have a PID loop, but running on top of it or underneath the PID loop would be a motion profiler. Um, and that could potentially make the motion of an elevator smoother, for example. You could sort of think of it as a more advanced feed forward controller than uh, what we've been using for things like elevators. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a ton of options for the talents that we haven't really explored. Uh, you can also read any errors that you have on the talents. They'll, they'll send them back to you. So if you need to know, error, know what error was going on in order to change something in the code, you could do that. So again, that's maybe an option for if something goes wrong with the motor, maybe we can be using these to, to detect those problems. Are there any questions on the CTRE blocks? I know I didn't go into all of them, but uh, let's sort of hit a couple of highlights. Okay. Uh, oh, one thing. Um, for the pigeon blocks for the inertial measurement unit, uh, everyone should know that, where is it? Um, this enter calibration block, we do need to use it in order to calibrate the IMUs. For whatever reason, in the current version of LabVIEW, we cannot, do not compile a version of code that has the intercalibration block anywhere in it um, and download it to the RoboRio. It will brick the RoboRio and we'll have to reset the whole RoboRio. So there's some problem with this particular block and how it deploys permanently to the robot. So just be aware of that. Um, in Rev, it's pretty much the same thing, except they've just got the one folder for the Spark Max. Again, uh, options for controlling those motors, um, options for setting up all the configuration for the motors, so uh, how to set the, set up the encoders, set the current limit, set uh, uh, direction, all that kind of stuff, whether it's a brushed or brushless motor. Um, they've got uh, all the values that you need to read all the blocks you need to read the encoders off of the NEOs. Uh, you can also read the current speed of the NEO, that kind of stuff. Um, the NEOs also have built in, excuse me, built in thermocouples, or I guess, yeah, built, I guess the NEO has a thermocouple that's being read at the, um, the Spark Max. So you can get the motor temperature, which is kind of nice. And we are using that this year. Um, Again, you have closed loop control options. So you can run a PID loop on the sparks. Uh, we're doing that for the, the shooter motors this year. Um, oh, that's not ready yet. This tells you what version of the uh, software you're running on the Spark Max. Um, the one thing that is nice about Rev that I haven't seen in any of the other third party libraries is also have examples. And so if I were to click this example here, it looks like one block. When you drop it onto the block diagram, it's actually a whole set of blocks. And it sort of shows you how uh, stuff would be connected as an example. So as you're learning how to use some of the code, they give you examples that way. Um, are there any questions about 
the rev block or anything that I talked about with WPI Robotics Library. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's all I have today. Uh, what we'll talk about next time, I'll put up a poll for what time people want to meet. Uh, the next one we'll talk about is sensors. And then uh, we'll also do some uh, review with Git, just so people get some more experience with how to use Git properly. And then the next one after that is machine learning. And uh, both the sensors and the machine learning one I need to prepare some for, so I'll need to make some slides and get that set up. Um, so I'll just sort of take that set up. That will bias a little bit when I say we can have, when, when I put at times I put on the polls. Um, and then those are the only ones that we have planned all the way out. Uh, the next ones that were voted on after that would be dashboard code, peer pursuit algorithm, and then robot odometry and post calculations are the ones that are voted on. Um, I think, you know, uh, it'd be good if we could start working on some vision tasks, maybe in parallel with this, so we can switch off between just uh, lectures and doing some new stuff. So if Alex wants to take the lead on getting people together in front with tasks for vision, that would be good. And maybe we can, maybe we can balance back and forth between those two things. Um, the other thing to maybe balance between is if we want to update any of the toolbox VIs, um, we can sort of balance between doing toolbox vision and uh, um, and lectures. Um, and yeah, again, if anyone is particularly interested in doing, uh, working on the toolbox stuff, let me know. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's all I got for you guys. Uh, if you got any questions, um, let me know. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Thank Thanks, you. Luke. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day.